So welcome to this lecture on traffic safety. So today we will talk about cooperative traffic safety applications and why we care about them. We'll then later dive into communications related stuff such as medium access control, physical layer transmission modes, a little bit of medium access control, desirable properties, and performance metrics of those. Okay, so why do we even care about traffic safety? Well, the answer is quite simple, actually. It's 1.24 million reasons per year. These are number, these is the number of deaths that are caused by traffic accidents every year. So part of solving this enormous problem, loss of life, human suffering, and also enormous cost for society, is to introduce technical systems to reduce this number. So part of the solution is V2X communication. So what is V? Well, V as in vehicle. It could be an ordinary car, it could be a truck, it could be a bus, and it could also be this type of construction equipment or other specialized vehicles that drive around on roads or some confined area. All of these vehicles require traffic safety. X then, well, X could be a vehicle or it could be road infrastructure. So what is road infrastructure? Well, it could be something like this, which is a toll uh, station for road tolls. It's some type of smart infrastructure that can communicate with vehicles. It could also be something like this, which are adaptive speed signs that uh, adapt the speed in order to maximize the traffic flow over this road segment. Or it could be regular, or let's call it stupid, infrastructure that's similar to what we have today on the roads. But even here, it would be beneficial to uh, equip this stop sign with the communications such that it could um, communicate with vehicles approaching it the time it takes to go from, say, red to green in order to, uh, for the vehicles then to adapt their speed in order to reach the intersection at the time when the light is green. So uh, we need communications. We need communications between vehicles and vehicles, for instance. And as we have seen in the, in the course, we can think of this as having a virtual data flow from the application layer at one end node to the application layer at another end node. But of course, the physical data may take a different path. It may go through an intermediate node and then it goes, uh, the data originates from the, this end system and goes down through the different protocol layers and then over to the next intermediate um, node up to its network layers and then down to the physical layer and then over to the final end node in this example where it goes from the physical layer up to the application layer. Well, and then also the number of layers here is debatable, right? Uh, we might have seven layers, five layers, or, um, or four layers, depending on which book you look at. But uh, let's not go into that uh, level of detail here. However, we can remember that the different layers have different um, functions. So the network layer is, for instance, uh, responsible for routing. The medium access control layer is responsible for retransmission protocols and medium access, and the physical layer is responsible for coding and modulation and other things. Cooperative traffic safety applications. So what are those? Well, uh, to see an example, we see the blue car is making a left-hand turn here. However, the blue car is not visible to the driver of the two-wheeler here due to the blockage of the line of sight by the truck. So here's a dangerous situation where the two-wheeler is approaching an intersection, but the blue car might drive out uh, into it and therefore cause a crash. Um, however, if the blue car here is communicating its position and intention to, to make a left-hand turn via radio waves that goes over to the red two-wheeler here, then an application in the two-wheeler can warn and inform the driver of a possible dangerous situation. And also, if the driver of the two-wheeler is not taking action, uh, for instance, reducing speed, then automatic systems can go in and reduce the speed 
in order to avoid a dangerous situation. So a cooperative traffic safety application is when several vehicles and road infrastructure is collaborating, cooperating in order to avoid a dangerous situation, that is to increase traffic safety. And as seen, for cooperation, we need communication. So vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication and vehicle-to-road infrastructure, V2I, are enablers for these type of applications. So what are the application requirements then? Well, it's pretty obvious from the situation just described that we would like to deliver data in real time, or rather, we would like to deliver the data without too much delay or latency over the channel. So how much latency can we tolerate? Well, that depends very much on the application. But for some applications, uh, it's uh, less than 100 milliseconds, maybe even down to tens of milliseconds. While for other applications, the latency requirement is more relaxed. But nevertheless, we typically have a deadline that is a maximum uh, allowed latency for our communication. We also need high reliability, and that is we don't want the applications to ever be fed information which is not uh, correct. So in our setting, that means that we should never uh, deliver uh, frames that contains undetected errors to the application. We also need it to be scalable, and that means we need support for many vehicles in the same area. So here is not a very congested area, but you can easily imagine a situation where there might be tens or even hundreds of vehicles interacting into a traffic situation. Okay, today's standards for V2V, vehicle-to-vehicle and vehicle-to-infrastructure uh, communications are based on a modified IEEE a modified Wi-Fi standard called IEEE 802.11p. 802.11 is Wi-Fi, if you remember this or if you've seen it before. And P is the special amendment, the special modifications that are done in order to uh, suit the application needs for traffic safety. And in particular, uh, this standard uh, specifies the physical and medium access control layers of the communication system. And the question is, of course, if this is a good choice. So we will elaborate a little bit on that as we go along. So first of all, uh, what are the data traffic models uh, needed for cooperative traffic safety applications? So my claim is that most safety applications will rely on two types of uh, data traffic. Uh, one is periodic broadcast of status messages. And these are messages which contain the vehicle's position, its uh, speed and heading, and so forth. Uh, so these are transmitted on a regular basis uh, with some periodicity, maybe 100 milliseconds between the, the uh, status messages, so, so maybe a little bit less, maybe a little bit longer. But anyways, it's periodically triggered, these messages. And then we have event-driven broadcast of warning messages. So these are sent when a specific event occurs. For instance, maybe I'm making a left-hand turn or I'm uh, doing an emergency braking or some other maneuver uh, that uh, we need quickly to inform the environment of, of, of uh, the vehicle's action. Um, so these uh, are called warning messages or, uh, and they are still broadcasted, meaning that it should reach all the receivers which are in radio range, and they're event-driven, so they are triggered by certain events. In Europe, uh, these first messages are called CAM messages, which stands for Cooperative Awareness Messages, and uh, the warning messages are called somewhat cryptically for Decentralized Environmental Notification Messages. Uh, these acronyms are not very important, uh, but that's what they are called. Okay. Now, since both of these messages are sent broadcast, that has certain implications. And one implication is that standard ARQ protocols with the acknowledgments and so forth are not very efficient, and we have to rely on forward error correction for error control. So uh, in the 802.11p standard, when transmitting broadcast here, 
uh, no uh, retransmission protocol is implemented. Otherwise, in regular Wi-Fi, we have uh, a variation of stop and wait uh, for error control. But anyways, to enhance uh, reliability then, then uh, these warning messages are actually repeated, they are sent several times uh, at a quick rate in order to uh, maximize the chances that the data is actually reaching the intended receivers. Nevertheless, uh, we will still use an error detection code, uh, namely a CRC code, in order to detect frames that contain errors. And the reason for this is that we would like to very much avoid uh, handing the application a frame that contains errors. This could uh, potentially have disastrous consequences for the application. For instance, we might even cause accidents rather than to um, prevent them. So the uh, upshot of this is that the CRC codes will prohibit frames. Uh, that is, uh, sorry, uh, so the CRC code would enable that the frames will, that will be delivered from the receiving medium access control layer will be virtually error-free. So speaking about the medium access control layer, so this is a part of the data link layer in the OSI model, the, the layer which is closest to the physical layer. So the medium access control layer, what does it do? Well, it defines how several transmitters share a common medium. So this is the medium access problem. And then it provides addressing and error-free data transmission uh, for the higher layers. So it has a certain um, element of error control in it. So the basic operations at the transmitter is that, uh, as usual, a protocol accepts data and addresses from higher layers. So this is true for the medium access control layer as well. And then uh, the medium access control protocol adds a MAC header and error detection bits, uh, or overhead if you like, these overhead bits, to form a frame. And then it provides this frame, which is called a MAC frame, and also a transmission mode to the physical layer. So the basic operation at the receiver, and we will talk more about the transmission transmission mode uh, in a short while. But the basic operation at the receiver is to accept um, a MAC frame uh, from the receiver physical layer. So it receives some bits that uh, are supposedly uh, containing a valid MAC frame. So the first thing to do is to check for frame errors, that is to use the CRC to do error detection. And then if the frame has no detected errors and also has the correct MAC address, then it's delivered to higher layers. Now, the MAC address for uh, traffic safety applications, since these are broadcast, then we use a broadcast MAC address here, and these are always accepted by uh, the receiving MAC uh, um, layer. Okay, so communication requirements, what are those? Well, we would like to have relatively low delays. We also want to have high reliability, good scalability, and we also need fairness. So again, low delay means that the transmission from the blue car should reach the red two-wheeler within a certain number of milliseconds. High reliability means that the data which is transmitted from the blue car coming to the red two-wheeler should never reach the application here when in error. Okay, so no erroneous data should ever reach the application. Good scalability means that uh, the communication protocols here should support many, many transmitters within the same physical area. Uh, fairness means also that since we have several transmitters in the same area, then we would like to make sure that these are given equal opportunity to transmit their data. That is, we should provide safety not only for, say, cars, but also for two-wheelers or trucks whoever's in the vicinity here should be able to transmit with uh, no uh, discrimination. So scalability, just to make a point what scalability is, here we see a, tip, a situation where we have many, many, many vehicles within the same area. And suppose that these are all transmitting these uh, periodic status messages, then we can see that the status message from this car is then sharing the channel with this car with this car and so forth. So we can easily see that a 
traffic congestion in terms of many vehicles in the same area also leads to radio channel congestion that many messages are sharing the same radio channel. Fairness in this setting means that we should not uh, make sh we should make sure that all the vehicles inside this area gets an equal opportunity to transmit its uh, status message. Now, going back to the physical layer. So the physical layer here is just below the MAC layer. So the physical layer defines how to convert the bits in a MAC frame, that is the frame it gets from the MAC layer, to radio channels which is suitable for transmission. And it provides a service which is an unreliable frame transmission service to the MAC layer. So uh, no specific, um, uh, yeah, so that's what it does. So basic operation at the transmitter is to accept frames and transmission mode, uh, physical transmission mode specification from the MAC layer, and then adds a, a physical layer header and encodes the data for error control. It also uh, adds a physical layer preamble and pilot symbols, and these are for synchronization and channel estimation purposes. Now in the course, we have not talked very much about this type of overhead. Um, but they are crucial for operation in real systems where we do need synchronization, time synchronization between the transmitter and receiver. We also need to estimate the channel, which we can think of as the amplitude change that happens over the channel, but also the phase rotation. Okay, so the basic operation of the receiver is to listen to for incoming signals, and as soon as one detects a physical layer preamble, uh, the receiver understands that, okay, here's a frame coming in, and the first thing to do is then to synchronize and decode the MAC frame. So this means a demodulation of whatever modulation format is used, and then use error control, uh, forward error control code uh, decoding to uh, try to detect and um, uh, correct uh, as many errors as possible. Okay, so the, the error detection here is not based on the CRC, but on some other code. Uh, in, in particular, it's a convolutional code for 11P. So talk more about that in a, in a second. Anyways, uh, after this is done, then it delivers the MAC frame to the receiver MAC layer. So note that the physical layer here is not doing error detection in the in this in this. Um, um, in the in the meaning that if error are detected, then the MAC frame is thrown away. It's the MAC layer that makes that decision later on. Uh, now, the physical layer transmission mode uh, that is something that decides the data rate and range of the of the system. So, if we look for uh, the 802.11p uh, standard, then the modulation. Uh, and uh, coding and so forth is determined by the physical layer transmission mode. So we have a table here, 18-4, and it's part of the IEEE 802.11 standard, um, somewhere in the middle. Uh, and each row in this table specifies a uh, physical layer transmission mode. So this one, uh, all these parameters, uh, belongs to one uh, transmission mode and this to the second, third, and so forth. Uh, there are many, there's a lot of information in here, so we're going to skip uh, most of it. But uh, on the in the first column here, we see that we have a specification of the modulation format. And since this is radio, then the typical modulation format which are used is some variation of quadrature amplitude modulation. So we see 16 QAM here, 16 QAM, 64 QAM, and, and 64 also down here. And QPSK is actually nothing but another word for four area QAM. So it's a, a quadrature amplitude modulation with four alternative, Q for quaternary, four. And BPSK here is just another word for two QAM, where B stands for binary. So we have here different modulation formats, and the number of bits per symbol for BPSK here is two, for QPSK is four, and for 16, uh, sorry, for number of bits for QPSK, let's start again. For BPSK, we have one bit per symbol, QPSK two bits per symbol, 16QM four bits per symbol, 
and 64 QAM, we have the log 2 of 64, which is 4, which is 8. which is 6. OK, so here's 6 bits per symbol. Um, if we go over here, we see that the standard is specified for three different bandwidths, 20 megahertz channels, 10 megahertz channels, and 5 megahertz channels. The standard used for 802.11p is uh, 10 megahertz. So we know that the um, bandwidth of the channel puts together with the Nyquist uh, criterion an upper limit on the number of symbols per second we can transmit. So this determines the symbol rate. And the symbol rate, together with the modulation format, that is the number of bits per symbol, specifies the bit rate or the data rate. So the data rate in megabits per second for the different modulation formats range from 3 megabits per second down to 27, up to 27 megabits per second when we use 10 megahertz channels. So the standard for uh, traffic safety applications is to use QPSK and with a rate one half convolutional code for error control. And that together gives us a data rate of six megabits per second. If we want to increase this, then we have to change the physical layer uh, somehow. And one way to do that is to go from QPSK to, say, 16 QAM, and then keep the, all other things fixed. And then we increase the data rate from 6 to 12 megabits per second. And the reason for that is that we go from uh, 2 bits per symbol to 4 bits per symbol. And the symbol rate is fixed because we are moving in the same column here, which specifies 10 megahertz channel. Another way to do it is to maintain the coding and modulation, that is QPSK and rate one half convolutional code, and then just increase the channel bandwidth from 10 megahertz to 20 megahertz. That gives a doubling of the symbol rate, which then also doubles the data rate, uh, that is the number of bits per second, if all other things are kept fixed. OK, so why do we want to increase the data rate? Well, the uh, the the um, the key observation here is that whatever data rate we have here needs to be shared by all the vehicles which are in the same vicinity. That is, this has to do a little bit about, uh, with scalability. So by increasing the data rate, that is to go down here or left, uh, down or left, that gives a higher data rate, then we decrease the congestion. That is, we can support more vehicles per uh, uh, in a specific geographical area because we have more data rate to share between these vehicles. Table 18.14 describes the receiver performance requirement as a function of tra a physical aid transmission mode. So again, it's a table whose rows are the physical layer transmission modes. And in this uh, column, the last three columns, actually, we specify the minimum sensitivity for 10 megahertz, 5 megahertz, and 20 megahertz channels. So what is the sensitivity? Well, the sensitivity for a receiver describes the smallest power required to reach a certain specified requirement. So in Wi-Fi, the performance requirement is 10 percent packet error rate. So to find the sensitivity, we start by uh, having a high receive power and then measure the packet error rate, which should then be low. And then we decrease the transmit receive power. So we re reduce the receive power, which means that the packet error rate goes up. And once the packet error rate reaches 10 percent, then the power that is uh, uh, needed to reach this is called the sensitivity. And in this table, we see for the standard physical layer transmission mode uh, for 802.11p, we have a sensitivity of negative 82 dBm. So dBm, 1 dBm, or uh, 
dBm is dB relative to milliwatts. So the M in dBm, so the M in dBm stands for milliwatts, meaning that zero dBm uh, is equivalent to a received power of one milliwatt. And then negative 282 dBm is roughly 10 to the minus 8 milliwatts. Okay, so it's quite low received power in order to reach the requirement of 10% packet error rate. So why is sensitivity important? Well, uh, it's because in radio, the transmit power is, uh, the maximum transmit power is usually uh, fixed or constrained, and this is true for uh, 802.11p, for instance. So when the transmit power is fixed, uh, the, as we move away from the transmitter, the received power gets less and less and less. So at some point, at some maximum distance, we have negative 82 dBm, and that specifies the range then of the transmission. Of course, if the uh, everything is kept fixed and we in, uh, improve the sensitivity, that is to reduce the power needed in order to reach the required packet error rate, then the range would increase. So for instance, if it was instead of 82, minus 82 dBm, that was the sensitivity, suppose it was negative 84 dBm, then we could extend the range of the transmission given a fixed transmit power. Okay, so range, uh, to, if we have better sensitivity, that's the same thing as saying that we increase the range of the transmission. And if you remember from the previous table, if we go from the default mode for 802.11p and we would like to increase the data rate to improve congestion, then we need to go to the left or down. And we see by going to the left or to down, we actually uh, making the sensitivity worse, or in other words, we are decreasing the range of the transmission. So, for example, if we have 10 megahertz spacing, then, and uh, the default transmission mode with QPSK modulation, then we need at least minus 82 dBm of received power. If we then increase the data rate to 12 megabits per second, that is to go from BPSK, sorry, go from QPSK to 16 QAM, then we see that the minimum power we need is negative 77 dBm, which is more than negative 82 dBm, which means that the range has decreased. We need to be closer to the transmitter in order to have acceptable performance. And the same thing happens if we go from 10 megahertz to 20 megahertz channels, we see that we go from negative 82 dBm to negative 79 dBm. That is, we need more power for 20 megahertz channels to reach the same performance as for 10 megahertz channels. Or in other words, the range of the transmission is decreased, which is typically bad. So we see we have a trade-off of data rate in order to control uh, congestion or scalability of the system, we would like to have a high data rate. But the price we have to pay for a high data rate is decreased range, either by going like this or going like this. So that we have a decrease of range. And also by going from here to here, we also need more channel bandwidth, which is typically uh, not always desirable. It's not desirable. So it's better if we can do it with 10 megahertz, that is better than if we need to have 20 megahertz. All right, uh, and okay, so finally, which one is the most attractive than going like this or going like that? And we see that uh, we need 3 dB more power, so we need to, do, um, 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 the, the, the range difference between here and here is determined by the difference in received power. So here we have three decibels and here we have five decibels. So three decibels is more desirable from that point of view.
but then we also go from 10 megahertz to 20 megahertz so we also need to increase the, the bandwidth so again for uh, transmission of digital data we need power and we need bandwidth and to increase performance we can either increase power or and bandwidth So let's now look a little bit about MAC layer and uh, some transmission error metrics. So suppose we transmit frames and we use forward error correction and we also use CRC for error detection. So what does that mean? Well, uh, the medium access control layer gets uh, some data from uh, uh, higher layers. So let's call them frames. And then they go through a CRC encoder. So the, the MAC frame that goes to the physical layer contains uh, some payload from higher layers and a MAC header and other things, including then the check bits for the CRC. These bits are then fed into the physical layer, which adds on forward error correction through a convolutional code. And then it goes to a modulator, which is then uh, this uh, QPSK or 16 QAM or something like that. And then it goes over the radio channel and comes to the demodulator that takes the radio channels and provides bits. Uh, and then this goes to a forward error correction code decoder. So it's a convolutional code decoder that tries to find as many of the errors that, that occur from this point to this point, try to find them and then also to correct them. Um, that is just simply to flip the bits where uh, in those positions where the forward error correction code decoder thinks that errors have occurred. So hopefully the, uh, the probability that a bit up here and the corresponding bit down here is different. So the bit error rate that goes from here to here is then reduced compared to the bit error rate from here to here. And that is uh, almost always the case. So here there will be some uh, bit errors and, and also some frame errors. Uh, uh, frames consist of a number of bits, as we know. And then the purpose of the MAC uh, layers then is to inspect these frames and uh, check if the CRC uh, check bits are the same um, in the received frame as they would should be. Uh, that's regular error detection, essentially, and those frames that are not uh, correct, that is that the CRC uh, checksum does not uh, um, agree between the receipt frame and uh, what it should be, then these frames are typically thrown away. So the probability that the frame that enters into this point and the frame that goes out into this uh, point that they are not the same is uh, reduced then to a even smaller uh, probability. So the bit error probability, it's the probability that a randomly chosen bit uh, is in error. So here's a bunch of bits coming here and then we pick one of those bits at random and calculate the probability that that bit is not the same when we come down to this uh, part in the, in the diagram. The frame error probability is that we take a random frame and then check whether that frame is the same here or here, or say between here and here. And then the probability that these frames are not the same is then the frame error probability. So in more detail, if we look at this intersection, that is the intersection between MAC and physical layer, then we have a bit error probability and frame error, uh, error probability. And this is before doing error detection. So PE, if that is uh, defined as the probability that a randomly chosen frame in this uh, intersection between MAC layer and physical layer is an error, this could divide it into two events. First of all, that the frame is in error and that the error eventually will be detected, uh, plus the probability that there is an error and uh, the event that the error will not be detected and here between uh, the detection is actually done in this stage here. So the frame error rate here <clears throat> consists of two parts. One, where there is an error and that error will be caught by the uh, channel uh, CRC decoder. And also when there is an error here and that will not be caught by the frame error uh, by the CRC decoder. 
So the probability that there is an error in the frame and the error is not detected, this is known as the probability of undetected error. Uh, and that is um, a very serious event. And this probability is, has to do with that the CRC uh, is unable to find uh, the error even though the error has occurred. So this is typically negligible compared to the first term, but still very serious. But anyways, the, the, uh, the part which is in the red box here is typically equal to the, or it's equal to the probability that the CRC check uh, fails. And it fails, uh, the CRC uh, uh, check procedure fails when there is an error when there is an error in the frame coming into the CRC decoder, but the CRC decoder believes that there is no error on in that frame. We also can talk about transmission delay metrics. And if we think of the delay between uh, over the channel as being tau, uh, and then we can define uh, something called the delay value function, Q, which indicates the quality of the transmission as a function of tau. So typically the quality of the transmission is something that decreases as the delay increases. So for instance, suppose we have a perfect quality that is quality equal to one for, for the, uh, uh, at this point where we have zero delay, then as we increase the delay, we typically never go up, but we can stay fixed potentially. Then after some point, then we start to have a decrease in the quality of the transmission and eventually the quality of the transmission is zero so the the transmission is basically useless um, so what is illustrated to the right here is something called the soft deadline where the quality function smoothly goes from one down to zero as we increase the delay tau uh, and then we can define a deadline as the time when the uh, quality uh, delay function starts to go down from one to a lower, smaller value. Uh, so most systems, I would claim, have some type of soft deadline. However, these um, systems are hard to analyze. So for analytical and simplicity purposes, we typically talk about hard deadlines. And the hard deadline is uh, when we have a quality delay function that is one, that we have perfect quality until we hit the deadline, and then suddenly the quality goes down to zero. So meaning that the transmission with a certain delay, which is below the deadline, is perfect. And as a transmission whose delay is above the deadline is um, completely useless. So this delay then can be measured at different positions in the transmission chain. And we will concentrate here on the MAC to MAC delay. So what is that? Well, the MAC to MAC delay is the uh, time difference between uh, the time it takes before, uh, uh, from when uh, the frame is delivered to the transmitter MAC until it's delivered from the receiver MAC. So if we look here at the transmitter uh, MAC and file layers, then from the higher layer, that is the layer above the MAC layer, we get a frame at some point, let's call it T0. And then there is some processing by the MAC and physical layers until the actual first uh, bits of the transmission uh, goes over the channel. And then it's some delay uh, until we get to this point. And this point is when all the bits in the frame that was transmitted has been received by the uh, receiver uh, physical layer. And then there is some physical layer and medium access control layer processing until the frame is then finally delivered to the layer above the MAC layer at the receiving end. So we can divide this uh, time between TD, the delivery time, and T0, which is the time when the uh, frame arrived at the transmitter MAC layer. We can call uh, the difference between this tau mm, which is the MAC to MAC delay, and that could be divided into three parts. One is which is the channel uh, access delay, one which is the propagation delay, and one which is the decoding delay. And note here that in the propagation delay here, we also have the time it takes uh, to transmit the frame uh, as such. 
So T, uh, T, Tx is the time when the first bit of the transmitted frame enters into the radio channel, and Trx is when the last bit of the transmitted frame is received by the received physical layer. Receive the physical layer. Okay, now we need to have some type of convention for when packet drops, how that in uh, affect the delay. And one way to do that is to say, as soon as we have a packet drop, then the delay of the channel is infinite. Okay, so when can packet be dropped? Well, packet can be dropped either at the transmitter when the channel access delay exceeds a hard deadline. That is, if the time from here to here exceeds the time which we have uh, to deliver the packet, then uh, there is no need to transmit the packet at all because it will never be uh, used at the receiver anyways. So why should we spend the time, energy, and, and bandwidth on transmitting some bits that eventually would never be used? So instead of transmitting the, the frame here, it's simply dropped, and it's dropped then at the transmitter side. Now, packets could also be dropped at the receiving side when, whenever the bits we received at this point in time are so um, um, full of errors that we cannot decode the frame. We can also think of this as being unable to detect the physical layer preamble, so we don't even think we'd, the receiver is not even aware of that uh, there is an incoming signal. Uh, and then we, we drop the packet here uh, regardless. Okay. So uh, I claim that much, or uh, in fact all, uh, um, performance can be inferred from the CDF or the MAC-to-MAC -MAC delay. Okay, so first of all, the MAC-to-MAC -MAC delay is the, uh, the time it takes from T0 to TD, and it's a, something which is a random variable. Why is it random? Well, it's because the processing time could vary, even though typically it doesn't vary that much, the propagation uh, time could vary a little bit, depending on the distance, and the decoding time could also vary a little bit because of the, yeah, uh, what, whatever uh, uh, computational uh, resources that the receiver might be uh, needed for other purposes at this time. But what also causes uh, uh, the MAC-to-MAC -MAC, um, delay to be a random variable is that because of packet drops which occur, for instance, due to the noise over the channel, uh, causes the delay to be infinite. So for sure, the MAC-to-MAC -MAC de delay is best modeled as a random variable. And if we have uh, the MAC-to-MAC -MAC delay as a random variable, then we can specify its CDF. So the CDF for the MAC-to-MAC -MAC delay is something that uh, is defined as the probability that the MAC-to-MAC -MAC delay is less than X, where X is the uh, axis towards which we plot the uh, CDF. So the CDF starts at zero. Okay, there are no negative delays. So the probability to have a negative delay is zero. And then it goes uh, increases as we uh, increase X. And then at some point it flattens out here. And the reason for this flattening out is because it remains stable uh, at, uh, until we hit the x equal infinity when it then jumps up to one. Okay, so the difference between the asymptote of the CDF and one is exactly the probability that the MAC to MAC delay is equal to infinity, which is then by definition the probability of a packet drop. And again, the packet drop could be either at the transmitter or receiver. Uh, for this, uh, we don't really care about that at this moment. Uh, now, if we have a deadline associated with the system, that is the maximum allowed delay of the uh, between the MAC to MAC, uh, the maximum allowed MAC to MAC delay, then we can read off a number from the CDF, and that is equal then to the probability that Q, the delay, uh, the quality delay function is equal to one, and this is something we call the, the MAC reliability. So if we want to have high reliability of the medium access control um, layer when we have deadlines associated with it, then it's actually not equal to, uh, to the asymptote in general, but rather to the value of the CDF function at the deadline. 
Um, now, going back to traffic safety applications, we also have a region of interest. So we do broadcast here, and we do broadcast because we want to reach a number of intended receivers. So the performance metrics that we uh, are uh, computing for these uh, uh, transmissions, we should only care about the intended receivers. So for instance, if this car is braking and would like to transmit a warning message, that warning message is not so important for the cars that goes in the opposite lane, and it's not so important for the car in front of it, but rather relevant for the cars that are following that car. So we have an intended region for a broadcast region. So the broadcast message here, when calculating, say, the probability of that being in error or received by, by uh, a number of receivers, then we should consider these three receivers and not the receiver, not the car, not the receiver that's in the car in front of it, and possibly not the ones which are in the opposite lane. So to conclude, the uh, physical and MAC layers are a crucial part of any vehicular ad hoc network, okay? And they are crucial because they greatly impact the scalability, reliability, and fairness of, of the system. So these, uh, both the MAC layer and physical layer need to be carefully designed. Data traffic for traffic safety uh, applications are typically broadcast. And this means that uh, retransmission protocols, ARQ protocols, are not very uh, attractive. And this basically has to do with the overhead of all the acknowledgments that needs to be handled in, in such a situation. Um, and error control is therefore mainly a, a physical layer issue, that is to reduce the number of errors in the frame. But then, of course, the MAC layer has uh, the task of rejecting frames for which the CRC is not uh, checked. So for which the CRC bit uh, in the receipt frame is not the correct ones. So performance uh, metrics for this vehicular ad hoc networks for traffic safety and traffic efficiency are a little bit different from traditional MAC and physical uh, layer metrics. So we advocate to use the uh, MAC to MAC delay as the main performance metrics. And since the MAC to MAC delay is a random variable, we claim that most of interesting uh, conclusions can be drawn from the CDF or the MAC to MAC delay. Okay, so that's everything for this lecture. I hope this has uh, proven to be of some interest to you. All right, bye-bye.